Milan's next move was absolutely key. Arrigo Sacchi had taken on the Italian national team role after his Milan side was disqualified from the European Cup and his continental dream was over for the time being. Berlusconi didn't hire a similar coach to Sacchi like many would, but he went down the wildcard route once again. He got somebody who knew Milan inside out, who had worked for them before. He chose Fabio Capello and he just about made them invincible. Milan had been damaged by the European Cup quarter-final defeat to Marseille. Not only had they left their European crown behind, but they had been embarrassed in doing so. Saki's football left the players burnt out, and now the supporters felt that burnout too, after they crashed out of the European Cup. They would have to pay for their misdemeanours, banned from UEFA competition throughout the first term of their next manager. By the time they would return, football would not be the same. After the likes of Chris Waddle, Jean-Pierre Papin, Didier Deschamps and Abide Pelé had schooled Milan, you'd have expected them to pick up the baton dropped by Milan. Those legends who watched our video, The Greatest Champions League Fix, will know that wasn't exactly how this story went down. Despite a belting penchant for fixing matches, Bernard Tapé's ownership of Marseille could not deliver them the European Cup of 1991. They were stymied by Red Star Belgrade in the final and were downed on penalties. As Yugoslavia crumbled in the background, however, it was clear that Milan's successors would be no dynasty. Marseille certainly still had the credentials to be the next great European team if they could skirt under the radar of the authorities, all alleged of course, well, some of it. They weren't the only long-term threat to Milan returning to greatness. There was a little-known fella called Johan Cruyff, and he was just about getting comfortable upon his return to the Camp Nou. He'd re-entered La Liga as Barcelona manager in a time that Real Madrid had whitewashed the league and therefore were the only Spanish representation in the European Cup for most of the latter part of the 1980s. Since, Cruyff had started to turn the ship. He'd got his players playing how he wanted to play, but crucially, he had demanded the club's academy, La Masia, changed with him. This was a power that Saki or any of his successors could never have in a world of Silvio Berlusconi pulling the strings. And when Barcelona defeated the Italian champion Sampdoria at Wembley to win their first European Cup in 1992, the warning signs were obvious. Europe was on high alert as the European Cup became the Champions League. If teams like Real, Ajax, Liverpool, Bayern and Milan could sweep up European titles in succession, then Barcelona seriously represented the likeliest team to replicate such a feat in the 90s. It wasn't just beyond the borders where Milan's threats were incredible. The beauty of how the European Cup and Champions League was formatted at the time, only the champions could qualify for the premier competition on the continent. And at the time, Serie A was the hardest league to win. Sure, Milan had won two European Cups on the bounce with Arrigo Sacchi, but Italian teams were busy cleaning up across all competitions. The UEFA Cup hadn't left the country since Napoli had won it in 1989. The two finals that followed were all Italian affairs and featured four different teams, Juventus, Fiorentina, Inter and Roma. Even the UEFA Cup final that an Italian team didn't win in 1992 contained Torino, who only lost the final on away goals. After that, there would be just one final without an Italian team in the last days of the 20th century. Juve, Inter and Parma all won the trophy on the bounce before a vacant 1996 gave way for four Italian appearances in three finals. Inter lost just one and won one, beating Lazio in the latter before Parma defeated Marseille in 1999. The Cup Winners' Cup? Much of the same. Sampdoria had graduated to their Serie A title and European Cup final by appearing in consecutive Cup Winners' Cup finals losing to Barca and beating Anderlecht. Palmer would perform similarly in 1993 and 94. So, under these conditions, in such a great league, for Milan to be great again, 
they had to find an incredible manager to fill the void left behind by one of the greatest to ever do it. Unlike Arrigo Sake, this man was a horse before he became a jockey. As part of a career that spanned 16 years, Fabio Capello played for both Roma and Juventus, as well as Milan, and 32 times for his nation. Don't forget Spal. Two years after his playing days were cold, Capello returned to Milan to join the Primavera setup in 1982. He'd be there four years whilst completing his coaching qualifications. That then allowed him to become Nils Leidholm's assistant during the 1987-88 campaign before he stepped into the firing line as the head coach on an interim basis. He did only take charge of six matches, but they were crucial in securing a spot in Europe for his successor. In fact, he had to defeat Sampdoria in a playoff to do so. In the intervening number of years, Capello remained wedded to Milan, but he took a step back from football for a few years. In this time, he coached other sports at the club. Lingering around the place like a fart in a lift, Capello knew the club inside out. Crucially, he knew the younger raft of players breaching the senior team too. If there was anyone more familiar to the DNA of the club still attached to it around this time, I don't know about them. Now his job was to pick up the pieces of Milan after the suffering of a silver medal against Sampdoria in the league and with no prospects of Europe in his first season. This was a club that had only won trophies via one-off occasions in the UEFA Super Cup against Sampdoria and in the Intercontinental Cup against Paraguayan outfit Olympia. This was a club used to being fed on the fat cat banquets being forced into back alley scraps like some kind of dirty rodents. The question now was, would Capello chop and change or would he stick to the trusty Saki tactics that delivered Milan their best days? If he did want to change things around the gaff, then he had plenty of opportunities to do so and could use their European expulsion as a positive. Yet, he wasn't to change much of anything, to be honest. The fabled 4-4-2 remained, so the bastardization of Italy's sweeper system remained in place as well. Very little personnel were changed either, but there was a horizon approaching quickly, especially in midfield, where three quarters of the starters were 30 or over, Roberto Donadoni, Carlo Ancelotti and Frank Rijkaard. The only changes came incrementally. Sebastiano Rossi had been acquired for goalkeeping depth by the prior management, but would be used more as a starter under Capello. The club had been warned he would last two or three seasons before capitulating. 330 appearances and 12 years later, he'd eventually be named in the club's Hall of Fame and only Christian Abiate had played more time for Milan between the sticks. Another promotion Capello saw fit to the senior team was Demetrio Albertini. Under Saki, the midfielder couldn't break into the team, playing in just four senior matches. He'd play in all but six league games in Capello's first campaign in charge and lasted as long as Rossi, albeit playing over 400 times for the club. Up front, Daniele Massara was moved to a more central role more often under Capello and would become more of a regular until his departure in 1995. Under Saki's management, Massara couldn't find any consistency and was subsequently loaned out to Roma. After quickly seeing that the grass wasn't greener, he had begged the former manager for him to return. Saki caved in and Milan received a hungrier player. In another universe, he could have prolonged the career of Marco van Basten by being the first line of defence as a pressing forward and leaving the goal scoring to the Dutchman. Mauro Tassotti would put in shifts in midfield, another difference to the Saki days. Overall, there was more of a flexibility handed to the players by Capello, who afforded the attackers freedom in the final third as the press was slightly eased off the gas. Capello was supposed to be defensively minded, or at least much less attacking than Arrigo Saki. They'd wind up scoring 74 goals in 34 league games in what was a defensive league. The next best record was Zdenek Zeman's Fodja, who both scored and conceded 58 goals, but they were a massive, massive outlier. 
of the 74 scored Van Basten netted 25 of them, proving that he was back to his free-flowing best. As one of the rare few that didn't wholly bind with the Saki style of football, the Dutchman was likely relieved of having to do less work off the ball. He was involved from the very first minute of the first game back at San Siro in bagging himself a penalty against Cagliari. And he was involved right until the very last minute of the last game, scoring twice in a chaotic 8-2 victory over Foggia that would make any traditionalist Italian football fan wet their little pants. His international colleague Rude Hullet did chip in with valuable goals even if he was missing large swathes of the season yet again due to injury. In stepped Daniele Massaro though to bag valuable goals and almost found double figures for the second time in his Milan career. They would only concede 21 league goals in Capello's first season, which is certainly an impressive statistic, but often it gets swept under the rug given the numbers previously put up by the club. All these statistics, all these stories, largely worthless. The one thing that matters is that Milan won the league and confirmed their place in the inaugural season of the Champions League. But I've hidden the best feat of this season. Fabio Capello's team went the campaign undefeated, winning 22, drawing 12. Not since 1923 had an Italian team gone an entire campaign undefeated and won the league. Nobody had done so, having played more Serie A games. Only Galatasaray's 1985-86 season had been completed undefeated in a longer season in Europe. But let's be honest, that was Turkish football in the 80s. This was an actual achievement, no offence. Plenty of teams had gone undefeated, at least in European football. The most famous continues to be Arsenal's 2003-04 Premier League. It has since been achieved in Serie A by, of course, the ever-lovable Juventus, as well as Porto twice in three seasons in Portugal. There is an argument, though, that says none of these feats were performed in a league as strenuous and as full of quality as Serie A was in the early 90s. The league was flush with cash, flush with European experience and contained what would be known as the Seven Sisters, Juve, Milan, Inter, Roma, Lazio, Fiorentina, Napoli and Parma, which is eight. That being eight enormous clubs who quite honestly probably filled out the top 10 to 15 clubs in world football at the time. Milan were majestic, right down to the evisceration they handed to champions and European finalist Sampdoria. They did so via a 5-1 humiliation in April, which effectively handed the title to the Rossoneri. Key victories against Inter and Napoli in the final weeks of the season not only confirmed the title, but an undefeated season. The Invincibles had been born. Well, Invincibles in the league anyway. Not to take any of the shine off her out, but they did kind of lose in the Coppa Italia semi-final second leg against Juventus in Turin. It remained the only blemish on what was a largely spotless first season for Fabio Capello. The first season afforded Capello carte blanche in the transfer market. In came Marseille's Jean-Pierre Papin, Zvonimir Boban off of Dynamo Zagreb, your boy Dejan Savicevic from former European champions Red Star Belgrade, before the world transfer record was broken to sign Gianluigi Lentini. Unfortunately, the world's most expensive player would never be able to fill that potential, building on a promising first campaign when a car accident ruined his career, fracturing his skull. At this time, though, it's worth remembering that the three foreigner rule was in place in both Italian and European competition. So let's tally them up. Papan, French, Boban and Savicevic, both Yugoslavian, as well as Rijkaard, Hullet and Van Basten, all Dutch. Mathematic masters will note that six into three does not go. And you didn't have to be much of a mystic Meg to see that selection headaches were in Capello's future. Frank Rijkaard would ease some of these fears slightly by declaring that he would leave at the end of the season. He was departing after being homesick for the Netherlands, so he would return to Ajax ahead of the 93-94 season. Some of the scorelines come across like my six-year-old son on FIFA, Pascara, a beaten 5-4, Fiorentina thumped 7-3, Lazio done 5-3 and Napoli thrashed 5-1. This was not football from this planet. 
the unbeaten run remained through a drawn Derby della Maddenina through a win away to Juventus against Sampdoria and Roma either side of Christmas and then back around to avoid defeat against Samp, Fiorentina and Lazio. The draw at the Olimpico against Lazio was match 58 undefeated in Serie A. All this through another run to the Coppa Italia semi-finals that included a Milan derby. All this through a return to the Champions League that was starting to look like it was going to end in the final at the Olympia Stadion in Munich. Then Fostino Aspria banged in a free kick at the San Siro, Milan nil, Parma won. The invincibility was gone, but they remained Serie A favourites. They would win just one of their last 10 matches, and thanks to the infinite wisdom of Serie A retaining two points for a win, Milan drew eight of their final matches to retain the league title for the first time in club history. After overcoming Olympia Ljubljana and Slovan Bratislava without conceding and scoring 12 goals, Milan were in the hat for the Champions League group phase. They could have hardly been drawn into a harder group. Whilst they avoided Marseille, who were comfortably the other great team left in the draw, Milan were handed three teams who had quite the knack for European competition. PSV had won the European Cup and even a treble in 1988. They had succeeded FC Porto as European champions, who also made up the group, as well as IFK Gothenburg. Don't go thinking that IFK Gothenburg are mugs, though. They had won the UEFA Cup in 1982 and 1987. Milan had shipped their first goal away in Eindhoven, but nonetheless had dispatched of each of their three group opponents before their domestic invincibility had ended. But could they continue that rich vein of form even after the Parma loss? They do say that when a team loses a long unbeaten run, they can go off the boil in dramatic fashion. Let's analyse that then. Juventus lost their cloak of invincibility in November 2012 and quickly got found out in the Coppa Italia, were almost eliminated from the Champions League and followed up their league defeat with only one winning four. Arsenal similarly spiralled out of control when they finally lost in the Premier League in October 2004. They won just one in six, got eliminated in the League Cup in this time and won just one Champions League match in four in this period. The only league game they won, of course, was against Tottenham Hotspur. Milan, well, they won the league, albeit only winning once and just simply kept on winning in the Champions League. Daniele Massaro's goal won Milan a place in the final in Sweden before retaining a 100% record in the final match against PSV Eindhoven. So it would all boil down to Munich on May the 26th. Marseille were busy fixing league and matches so they could ease up in time for the Champions League final and hope to clinch their fifth league in a row afterwards. Meanwhile, Milan already had their second Serie A in succession in the can and were well rested ahead of the trip to Germany. Their minds were blatantly on the final and now it was here, Capello had to break a few hearts in his team selection. Marco van Basten had barely played since suffering an ankle injury against Ancona in December. Little did we know, we had already seen the last of the three Dutchmen on the pitch together. Van Basten's recurring injuries left him shelled for six months and only in the latter stages of the Serie A season did he return. This was enough of a whiff of good news for Capello to plunge the Dutchman into the deep end of the starting eleven. It was a risk, everybody knew it, the supporters, the manager and the opposition. Blatantly so, because Jean-Pierre Papin was the man on the bench as the third foreigner. With Frank Rijkaard occupying his usual position in central midfield, there was no room in the squad for Ruud Hullet. A combination of this, Van Basten's injuries and Rijkaard's homesickness, ensured that the three would all effectively depart Milan full-time that summer. The question now, was the £34 million going to be well spent? Only a third of that value made the pitch that day, the fateful figure of Gianluigi Lentini. Marseille were comfortable in holding off Van Basten and the soon-to-be villain of the piece, John Jacadelle, was busy quieting Lentini down the Milan left. Despite this, Milan kept pouring forward to test the Marseille goalkeeper, Fabian Barthez, with hair, with all kinds of efforts. Ultimately, the game would be settled by a late first-half header from Basili Bolli, the one from all eternity, you'll remember, and Marseille were European champions. They would not be back to defend their title next season. Because Rijkaard returned to Ajax, because Hullet departed for Sampdori, because Van Basten's football career was over, the era of the free Dutchman was gone and Capello brought in a big 
midfield reinforcement. The European champion himself, Marcel Desailly, was poached from a Marseille club who would be sent down to Ligue 2 for match fixing, and it was a sign of things to come. If the £34 million spent in the summer of 1992 was a different side to Milan, the tumultuous comings and goings prior to the 93-94 campaign changed the Rossoneri forever. Only now, officially, was the Arrigo Sacchi Milan history. Defensive football was back in, and Marcel Desailly would be utilised as a holding midfielder ahead of the usual foursome of Mauro Tassotti, Franco Baresi, Alessandro Costa Curta, and of course, Paolo Maldini. Zvonimir Boban and Dejan Savicevic were given more chances in the squad ahead of the new shiny foreign toys of Florin Rodichoyu and Brian Laudrup, whilst Daniele Massari was left to lead the line. The 4-4-2 had become the 4-1-4-1. The result was stark. The result was stark. Milan barely scraped a goal a game, the type of statistic that would either get you the sack or get you relegated quick time. But this was Serie A in 1993 and 94. Milan wound up winning the thing, conceding just 15 goals. To put it into perspective, in Milan's first of three league losses, they shipped a fifth of their total goals in a 3-2 defeat away to Sampdoria. Of their 12 draws, eight were goalless, and the club kept a staggering 21 clean sheets from 34 matches. Nine of their 19 league goals came with a popular 1-0 scoreline, and a further five were won by a single goal. They failed to score three goals in a single match in Serie A, and matches that constituted a thrashing were the dizzying September successes against Atalanta, Roma and Cremonense, all won two goals to nil. In the end, it wasn't even much of a close affair. Milan didn't even need to win any of their last six matches, still beating Juve to the title by what was still a chasm of three points, given the two points for a win scenario. Because Marseille were pure bastards, Milan took up their spot in the Intercontinental Cup against Sao Paulo as European runners-up. In what could only be described as a barnstorming goal frenzy, Sao Paulo pinched the trophy with a late goal in a 3-2 win before losing after extra time in the UEFA Super Cup against compatriots Parma. All that paragraph does, however, is discount just how dangerous Milan were in continental competition. Following a similar format, at least in the early knockings, Milan cruised into the group phase after being dispatched to Switzerland and Denmark. They progressed once again without conceding and scoring a frankly obscene nine goals in four games, six of which came in Copenhagen in a second round first leg which must have been a matter of disobedient players continuing to attack. Either way, Milan were given a bigger cushion in these group stages because UEFA kindly created a semi-final stage which allowed for two qualifiers from each group. The Rossoneri were at their most entertaining, drawing half of their games nil-nil and winning just twice to comfortably top the group. Enticingly, they were drawn the replacement of Marseille in the semi-final Arsene Wenger's Monaco. Milan were imperious defensively, so when Marcel Desailly scored against his compatriots in the 14th minute, the game was as good as done. Second half strikes from Albertini and Massara were merely decorative. It all remained the same. Milan were in their fourth European Cup final in six seasons. Barcelona had dispatched of Porto in the other semi final, so the rightful two best teams in the competition would make up the final in Athens. Whilst this was a very different Milan team, both in style and in personnel from their winning of the finals in 1989 and 1990, Barcelona lined up with the same style with just four changes from 1992. The crucial difference came in their third foreign player selected. Just like Brian Laudrup missed out for the Rossonieri, he'd be joined by his brother Michael on the sidelines after Cruyff opted for Romario alongside the 92 finalists Ronald Koeman and Harissa Stoichkov. When the team sheets were doled out, Fabio Capello breathed a huge sigh of relief. He had feared Michael Laudrup's abilities and would later declare his omission as a mistake from the Barcelona manager. Despite this, Barca were still heavy favourites to win the final. This was thanks in part not to Milan's change to a more defensive style, but their absentees. 
Gianluigi Lentini hadn't properly recovered from his horrific car accident that would all but cost him his career at the top level of the sport, but he made the bench. He wasn't the big omission, however. Milan found their defence obliterated by the suspensions of captain Franco Baresi and his central defensive partner, Alessandro Costa Curta, who by now was a mainstay alongside the captain. Consequently, Maldini moved inside into centre-half alongside Filippo Galli, who was by no means inexperienced, was two days into his 33rd year on this rock we call planet Earth. Meanwhile, 21-year-old Christian Panucci moved to occupy Maldini's left-back berth. Barcelona were utterly swamped. Daniele Massari was open on the back post to tapping across after a wonderful day on Savicevic run. The Italian was left undetected in the penalty area for the second in first half stoppage time as he simply stood still and gifted himself all the room in Athens. When he received the ball, a simple high finish into the net was all that was needed. The scorer of the third goal would then go on to dictate the remainder of the match and what a goal it was. Savicevic hurried a Barcelona defender into a clearance and robbed him of the ball. With his first touch, he aimed an inch-perfect volleyed lob from an angle over the helpless Andoni Zubizarreta in the net. All that was left was for Marcel Desailly to sum it all up before the hour and Milan had thrashed Barcelona. The European Cup was now Milan's to keep. And that was effectively the end of the road for Fabio Capello's Milan when viewing the timeline smugly with the hindsight of three decades. A third Champions League final in succession was supplemented with the sour taste of a disappointing fourth place in the league. Marcello's Lippi's Juventus were now in the ascendancy and previous minor clubs in Parma were now bona fide title challengers. Despite a points deduction in the group phase, Milan snuck through to the knockouts, but they had already seen their future in the groups when they were left wanting against group winners, Ajax. Roberto Baggio and George Weyer had come in, but a little bit of the magic went the other way. Milan had to reap what they sowed. In the 1994 final, they were the underdogs coming up against the Colossus. 12 months on, they had become the hunted, when a youthful and vibrant Ajax side playing not too dissimilar football to Cruyff's Barcelona won out thanks to a late winner from youngster Patrick Kluivert. Fabio Capello no longer felt valued after the defeat. He had determined two things as he laid there suffocated by the defeat in Vienna. One, he had to leave Milan. Two, he had to leave as a Serie A champion again. Twelve months later, he made true on both of those promises. They decimated Serie A, finishing an incredible eight points ahead of the Champions League win in Juventus. It's a damn shame that on British shores he's compared to some cartoon postman and more known for his below average return for the England national team. He wouldn't be remembered as well across the continent, Italy included, as Arrigo Sacchi. Despite this, Capello has appeared in more European Cup finals as a manager and was more proficient in domestic football as he wound up with five Serie A titles and two La Liga crowns. Yet it remains true that he owes an enormous amount of his successes to Saki. The jockey was the one who cracked the whip at the San Siro so the horses that came after him could gallop freely into the Champions League era and be successful. He installed the ideas and hard work, and his successors feasted on those. Without either Capello or Saki, Milan spiralled into obscurity. Both tried to come back to the job to rekindle something from inside the Rossonieri, but the time had passed. Players as esteemed as Michael Reisinger, Edgar Davids, Roberto Baggio, Patrick Vieira and Patrick Kluivert all came through the club without much of an impact. Points tallies became closer to 40 than 70, and Milan even ended the 96-97 season six points off the relegation zone. That was the campaign where this iteration of Milan truly died. Both Franco Baresi and Mauro Tassotti retired, and attempts to replace them fell flat on their ass. It was a club that had gone through the highest of highs, and with every elongated empirical peak, Milan were experiencing the lowest of troughs. There was one man who was capable of dredging them back to where they belonged. And that is a story we'll tell 